président, veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now back in session. And we would Nous like to give again the floor to the national co-prosecutor to la continue la her opening statement. You may now proceed. National co-prosecutor. Co I'd like now to resume my opening statement. War crimes committed during the armed conflict with Vietnam. Merci. The accused are also charged with grave breaches of the Geneva Conventions committed by the forces under their command during an armed conflict between the forces of the Democratic Cambodia and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam. Opposant les soldats du Cambodge démocratique et de la République Socialiste du Vietnam. Dans le dossier 1, la Chambre between a conclu qu'il existait des hostilités armées entre le Cambodge et le Vietnam entre le 17 avril 1975 et le 6 janvier 1979. We will show that an international armed conflict was afoot during this period, and that the laws of war were therefore applicable to conduct of both sides. Between May 1975 and March 1978, the DK forces engaged in incursions into Vietnamese territory carrying out attacks on Vietnam. villages in Tainan, Dong Tham, and Jiang, and Kinjiang provinces. Tham, et These incursions were accompanied Dans by acts of mass murder, pillage, and senseless destruction directed de at the civilian population. The result in the death civile. or disappearance of more than 30,000 people and the displacement of 400,000 more. And of 400, Hundreds of Vietnamese civilians and soldiers des centaines were captured de by the forces et de été during this raid, par les forces du Cambodge démocratique. As can be seen in this video clip, comme vous pouvez le voir dans ce bref extrait vidéo. POW Tran Ban Phuong revealed that the plan of the Communist Party of Vietnam was to set up puppet regimes at all levels of Cambodia. From these confessions. It is evident that the Vietnamese aim at forcing Kampuchea to join an Indochina federation dominated by Vietnam. We were transferred to S21 for interrogation and execution. Their confessions were used as propaganda by the leadership of the CDK who had them broadcast on Il Phnom Penh radio as supposed evidence of Vietnam's Penh aggression against Cambodia. Of the 345 recorded Vietnamese victims at S21, 122 were registered as prisoners of war and 70 as civilians. These arrests were reported back to the upper echelon by On some Sen de and others. Keeping the accused apprised of the crimes. Nadia Chanda, a war correspondent working in Vietnam, described the aftermath of an attack on her team. Nadia Chanda, correspondent de guerre qui travaillait au Vietnam, a décrit le lendemain de l'attaque. Next to a completely gutted house, lay 15 bodies, men, women, and children. Près d'une maison éventrée, reposaient 15 cadavres, hommes, femmes et enfants. Some of the staves with which they had been beaten to death still lay around. Probablement, les avaient tués, traînaient encore loin de là. One stave was stuck between the legs of a spread. L'un d'eux était enfoncé entre les jambes. Eagled, naked woman. D'une femme écartelée, nue. Her two children had been cut to pieces. Ses deux enfants avaient été coupés en morceaux. A few bodies were headless. Certain cadavres étaient décapités. Some were disemboweled and covered with blue flies. Les entrailles à l'air disparaissaient sous les mouches. House after house presented the same gory sight. Toutes les maisons, sans exception, offraient le même spectacle de cauchemar. A former DK soldier, being sent to Vietnam, 
Comment il a été envoyé au Vietnam avec des ordres de brûler et de tout détruire. Sous ces ordres, donc, sous de tels ordres, les soldats ont détruit des maisons, des hôpitaux, des usines. Son unité fait des prisonniers vietnamiens, surtout des femmes, envoyés à se battre un pour être torturés et un autre combattant a décrit les ordres que son unité a reçus de tuer tous les Vietnamiens qu'il pouvait, qu'ils soient militaires ou civils. Yet another witness overheard Khmer Rouge soldiers discussing incursions Un autre témoin into Vietnamese territory des soldats Khmer Rouge discutant d'incursions dans les territoires vietnamiens et them in the air se vantaient sur bayonets. la façon dont ils prenaient des enfants, les jetaient the dans les airs et les transpercés à coups de bayonnets. Les preuves qui vous seront montrées démontreront que ces crimes ont été commis en respect des ordres donnés par le centre du parti du PCK. Les accusés ont soit participé à donner de tels ordres ou étaient avec pleinement connaissance de ces crimes. Ils n'ont pas agi en tant que supérieurs pour prévenir ces crimes ou punir les autres. One of the final criminal episodes prior to the toppling of the CPK was a massive purge of the East Zone and the forced transfer of nearly its entire population to other parts of the country. This is the last series of crimes with which the accused have been charged and with which I will now discuss. As my fellow co-prosecutor will describe in more detail, a series of unexplained events led the CPK leadership to suspect in early 1976 that it was under the threat of a coup d'état. These events led to the arrests and interrogation of individuals who implicated several senior East Zone cadres as traitors. By 1977, Sao Pem, the East Zone secretary who was a member of the CPK standing committee, and killed some Pem's deputy on the state L'adjoint de Kyosampan au Présidium d'État a lui-même été impliqué. CPK, accused, les autres dirigeants du CPK, y compris les accusés, en sont arrivés à la conclusion que la zone Est était truffée de traîtres et que Sao Pim lui-même n'était pas loyal. This was only confirmed by the successful incursions of the Vietnamese forces into the East Zone in December 1977. The resulting purge, which was initiated by the party center, encompassed the entire East Zone and resulted in the death of somewhere between 100,000 and 250,000 lives. This was likely the single largest killing operation orchestrated by the CPK. The operation was executed by senior leader, senior Khmer Rouge cadres such as Son Sen, Kai Pok, and Tamok. Exécutés par des cadres de hauts responsables Khmer Rouge comme Son Sen, Kai Pok et Tamok. The accused were immediately involved in the process of and had full knowledge of the. Murderous events that took place under their orders. Nguyen Tien assumed a leading role in the planning of the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to the purge and instructed military cadres who were sent to
quale Senior Cadres were sent to S21. In fact, so many Senior Officials were being sent to Phnom Penh that Moon Chia instructed Deutsch to execute 300 of them without conducting the standard interrogations. Many lower level Cadres were executed some Merely on the outskirts of their villages, often with their wives and children. Sommaire, du village, Both villages in Ponyer Craig district, Kampong Cham province, Ponyer was particularly targeted Cham, in the east zone purge due to its long-standing connection to South Pum. The village was a traditional base area and had sheltered senior CPK leaders such as Alport, une zone de base traditionnelle et avait d'ailleurs des dirigeants principaux du PCK comme Paul Paul Munchia et Thierry Tayon dans les années 60. Il était vu comme un village modèle. Dignitaries. This model village of base people who had proven their loyalty to the Khmer Rouge was now to be wiped out for the crime of perceived association with Sao Pum. The evidence was shown on or about 4 June 1978 that both villages were gathered and instructed to depart under the pretenses of being reallocated to another village. They were loaded into trucks and driven east towards a dense forest known as Teng Tau. Upon arrival, they were surrounded by soldiers and tied up. They were accused of being CIA operatives and the contemptible Pim's children. Starting with the males, the villagers were gathered in groups of five to eight, tied together with ropes, and marched into the forest to previously dug pits, where they were executed. One of the surviving witnesses describes the mass execution. The soldiers simultaneously hit each individual with wooden poles into the pit. Regarding the pit where I was struck, it had just been dug, and it was about 60 meters from the road. There were eight dead bodies already there, which were covered with blood, and I was hit into the pit over the eight corpses. Around 7 p.m. on the same day, I got out of the pit and ran to seek a hiding place in the forest near there. I heard the victims who were being taken there by the military pleading that they had done nothing wrong and they wondered why they were going to be killed. In response, the military said they all belonged to the CIA and it was useless to beg. Qu'ils faisaient tous partie de la CIA. Another villager managed to save herself and her children by convincing the central zone cadres who carried out the execution that her son was a soldier in the central zone. However, she describes watching her husband being sent off with the rest of the men to be executed. Her grief is such that she cannot hear, rather, she cannot bear to return to the look at the grave or exhume her husband's body. One question your honors may be asking is why an entire village was sent to their deaths in such a fashion. The both villagers had proven since the early 1960s that they were loyal to the Khmer Rouge revolution. They had been considered to be model citizens. The answer is that in the midst of the accused, rather, in the minds of the accused and the other CPK leaders, the more association of these villages with a pursued traitor was enough to condemn them to death. Following mass executions in the East Zone, the Après final phase of the purge was implemented by a removal of the entire est, civilian population from the zone to other parts of the country, toute la population de la zone the Northwest, Central, Northeast, and Northwest, Central, 
nord-est et nord. La majorité de la population de la zone est a été transférée dans les secteurs 2 et 7 de la province de Pursat dans la zone nord-ouest. Hear how the evacuees were described as having command bodies, but Vietnamese heads, and were said to have betrayed on guard. You will hear how those who resisted the evacuation were shot on the spot. The evidence will prove that by the time this purge was complete, the East Zone was almost completely empty of civilians. Zone Est était presque vide de civils. East Zone evacuees were given Blue Ceux qui ont été évacués de la zone Est ont reçu des cramas de bleus pendant leur transport à l'extérieur de la zone Est. Ce foulard bleu a été ben utilisé Kenan pour has identifier les victimes. Ben Kiernan a indiqué le témoignage suivant. Lancar commençait à nous distribuer des vêtements, en particulier des écharpes et des couvertures. Il y avait des bleus, blancs et des verts et blancs. Tout le monde a reçu une écharpe. Il n'y avait pas assez de couvertures. Il n'y avait qu'une par famille. Mais pour ce qui est des écharpes, il y en avait une par personne. J'en ai truck vu sur plusieurs camions. On déchargeait un camion, puis un autre arrivait. Il y avait no beaucoup d'écharpes. Personne ne pouvait pas avoir. The evidence will show that these blue scarves were used as markers to identify the East Zone evacuees for persecution and execution. East Zone evacuees were routinely slaughtered, regardless of which zone they were sent to. This is how Philip Short describes these events. Hundreds of thousands were deported to the Central Zone. Il y a eu également des centaines de milliers de déportations en direction de la zone centrale du nord et du nord-ouest suivi de nombreuses exécutions. On ne connaîtra jamais le chiffre précis des victimes. Certainement, plus de 100 000, peut-être jusqu'à 200 000. En tout état de cause, ce fut l'épisode le plus sanglant du régime de Pol Pot. East Zone evacuees who were sent to the Northwest Zone and lived to arrive in Posat were sent to the carpenters and work sites where they were forced to dig canals and work in the rice fields. Their biographies were screened to identify former village chiefs, communities, deputies, teachers, policemen, and soldiers. If discovered, such people were subject to immediate arrest and execution. Shortly before the arrival of the Vietnamese in 1979, thousands of the remaining East Zone evacuees were rounded up and executed. A CPK platoon chief describes transporting the victims to Ville Bac Tum Chinh, where thousands were killed. He states. We gathered about 30 ox carts for transporting the people. It took three to four days to transport them. There were so many people in thousands, I guess. When we arrived in Ville Bac Chin Chin, we saw the Khmer Rouge soldiers. We ordered the hiding in the reed bushes nearby. Or rather, the Khmer Rouge soldiers were already hiding in the reed bushes nearby. My group unloaded the people and their belongings nearby. Then I saw the Khmer Rouge soldiers walk people away and shot them dead at a place about 100 meters away. Those people had been transported 
by the Khmer Rouge from all cooperatives to be killed in the pond of the de toutes les coopératives pour être tuées dans le lac de Bac Those people including children and adults, Parmi ces personnes, il y avait des enfants, des men. adultes, des femmes, des hommes. We will also present evidence of the massacres of some 300 des East Zone de evacuees at the de Chan Reang Sai Pagoda in Romlik commune. Dans la commune de Romlik. This is how a witness describes his observations of un the scene. Un témoin ainsi ses observations de la scène du massacre 1979. en 1979. Les cadavres étaient et les vêtements étaient éparpillés partout dans les rizières. Il y avait des remaining which had not yet decomposed from which it could be recognized that these people had come from Preveng and Swaiwing provinces. Ces cadavres étaient ceux d'habitants venus de Preveng et de Swaiwing. Village still exists today. Les fosses que l'on retrouve dans Your le village honors, de Kocknow. The purge of the East Zone represented the culmination of the CPK leadership's obsession with destruction of its enemies. We will show that the senseless crime arose from nothing more than paranoia of the leadership, including crimes incidents to the people of the East Zone. We will show that the senseless crime arose from nothing more than paranoia of the leadership, including crimes incidents to the people of the East Zone. We will show that the senseless crime arose from nothing more than paranoia of the leadership, including crimes incidents to the people of the East Zone. The sheer scale of the operation reflects the fact that it was ordered and organized by the party's leadership. Numerous high-ranking CPK cadres who were answerable to the party's leader were present on the ground and directed the operations against the East Zone population. As I indicated earlier. Witness testimony confirms that Nguyen Chia took direct part in instructing the military. The purge of the East Zone was a final tragic episode in the implementation of CPK's criminal policies, which tore apart hundreds of thousands of lives. We will show that the accused took active part in the criminal plan which led to these crimes and that they must be held responsible for them. Thank you. 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 I will conclude my remarks with a brief legal characterization of the crimes with which the accused have been charged. Each of the accused is charged individually with genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. Pursuant to Article 4, 5, and 6 of the ACCC law, the destruction of Vietnamese and Cham minorities amounted to genocide under Article 4 of the ACCC law. The accused contributed significantly to the criminal plan, which led to the commission of this crime. Did so with the intent of destroying the two ethnic groups. Dans de the evidence ces deux will ethnic. show beyond a reasonable doubt that the les direct perpetrators of the executions acted under the orders of the CPK les ordres party center, du parti du orders PCK. whose purpose was the complete de ces annihilation était totale of these groups. De ces groupes and the creation of an ethnically pure society. Pure the evidence will also show that the jurisdictional elements required under Article 5 of the ECC law for crimes against humanity have been fulfilled. The crimes committed against Cambodians were part of a widespread and systematic attack against the country's entire civilian population, which as part, which as at April 1975 was between 7.8 and 8.1 million people. The attack was widespread by reason of its large scale, nature, extended duration, vast geographic area, and the number of victims. This attack lasted over three years and eight months and took place across the entire territory of Cambodia. It involved thousands of military troops and CPK cadres throughout the country. Partout au pays.
the CPK s attack against the Cambodian population involved the forced movement of more than 2 million civilians from the urban centers and the enslavement of the entire population in corporatives and work sites. Dans des More than 200 security centers function de de as an integral part of the attack on the civilian population. population Hundreds of thousands of individuals were imprisoned, individuals tortured, and executed. Torturé, the number of deaths caused de by the attack has been estimated as estimé being between 1.7 and 2.2 million people, including some 800,000 to 1.3 million violent deaths. The attack on the civilian population in Cambodia was also systematic. It was carried out pursuant to a centrally devised and coordinated policy to perpetrate violence on a countrywide scale. It was highly planned and organized and followed the directives issued by the CPK leadership, including the accused. It occurred in highly consistent patterns throughout the country. CPK officials took part in the crimes at all levels and reported on their actions PCK to the party center. The vice president and systematic attack on the Cambodian population was discriminatory on political grounds as it was driven by a radical political revolution. Dont le moteur the était CPK une leadership révolution sought to break up politique. any political opposition to its PCK rule. It considered all members of the civilian population as potential enemies and discriminated against them on this basis. The attack was also based on religious grounds as it entailed the abolition of all religions Finally, it was based on ethnic grounds in so far as it involved the persecution and destruction of minorities, including the Cham and the Vietnamese. The prosecutor will prove that the accused are responsible for crimes against humanity, murder, extermination, enslavement, imprisonment, torture, rape, persecutions on political, racial, and religious grounds, and other inhumane acts. These crimes were committed throughout the period covered by the closing order, as I have indicated in dealing with each group of events. As my fellow Co-prosecutor will set out these crimes and the international law were committed pursuant to a common criminal plan to which the accused agree and significantly contributed. According to the closing order, this common purpose entailed the following policies. The repeated movements of the population, the establishment and operation of cooperatives and work sites, the re-education of bad de elements de and killing of enemies both éléments, inside and outside the party ranks, the targeting of specific groups, including the Cham, Vietnamese and Buddhists, the use of forced marriage. The accused together developed and implemented this policy with full appreciation of their consequences. They put in place a system of strict reporting to ensure that CPK cadres at all levels kept them informed about the implementation of their policies. They were thus continuously informed about the commission of crimes throughout the country, including the crimes covered by the closing order. There can be no doubt that these accused were the driving force behind this criminal enterprise and its active and willing participants. As such, 
they must actif. bear criminal responsibility for each Ils donc être and every crime with which the closing order charges them. Par la décision de renvoi. The accused are also responsible for grave breaches Les of the Geneva Convention de and the Article de 6 de Genève, of the ECC. These crimes were committed during an international armed conflict which lasted between April 1975 and January 1975. They include willful killing, torture, inhumane treatment, and unlawful confinement. The victims were Vietnamese civilians and prisoners of war who had the status of protected persons under the Geneva Conventions 3 and 4. These crimes were committed by members of military forces and security cadres acting under the orders of the accused. Again, the evidence will establish that the accused took part in the criminal plan which led to the commission of these crimes and are therefore responsible for them. Your Honours, the evidence you will hear Madame, les juges, will show that the regime presided over by the accused les was one que vous of démontreront was one of the most brutal and horrific in modern history. In the three years, eight months, and twenty days that followed, the 17th of April 1975, the CPK enslaved the entire Cambodian nation. It caused the death of one in every four people living under its rule. To be forced to leave one's home, to lose one's family, to be denied the freedom of movement, speech and religion, to be subjected to forced labor, starvation, torture and abuse, to live in the constant fear of execution, de vivre short, dans la peur constante de l'exécution, de se voir dépouillé de toute This dignité humaine. Voilà le cauchemar devenu réalité pour des millions de Cambodiens ordinaires entre le 17 avril 1975 et le 6 janvier 1979. Every Cambodian who lived through the regime was affected by the CPK policies. The crimes charged in this case are representative of this suffering. Even within the specific crime size covered by the closing order, the suffering and pain inflicted on the victims is nothing short of staggering. Et la the scars that this country bears will take Les generations de ce pays to heal. One of the tragic consequences of the crimes committed by the CPK regime is the fact that hundreds of thousands of victims remain buried in unidentified locations, having never been exhumed identified and given a proper burial by their loved ones. To this day, thousands of people grieve even without the knowledge of the final resting place of their relatives and friends. However, this trial is not about revenge. It is about the ascertainment of the truth and the determination la of de la guilt. In this process, Et the accused are entitled to a fair trial. They are entitled to be presumed innocent and to be presented their defense. Leur
Rather, to present their defense unlike the millions of Cambodians who suffer Cambodians at souffert. the hands of the Communist Party of Cambodia, we will prove the accused guilty in this court of law in which Cambodians and the international community have come together to secure a small measure of justice for the millions who have suffered. We will provide a small but indispensable contribution to the healing of this nation, to the departs and perpetrators of atrocities et aux around the world. We will send this message. Nous le message Justice never forgets. La justice Most importantly, jamais. we will ensure that the truth surtout, is told and that justice prevails. Et que justice In soit the rendue. words of Buddha, Selon les mots overcome du Buddha, the angry by non-anger, overcome the wicked by goodness, overcome the miser by generosity, overcome the liar by truth. Le mensonge par la vérité. Thank you, Your Honours. Madame, Messieurs les I juges, will now je vous remercie. give the floor to my colleague, je laisse maintenant la parole à mon collègue, Mr. le co-prosecuteur Andrew Kelly. Andrew Kelly. <coughs> Mr. President, thank you, National Co-Prosecutor. We next hand over to the International Co-Prosecutor. May it please the Court. Um, Your Honours, I anticipate in the final time available today that I will probably complete my introductory remarks. Um, and before I begin, let me explain to you what I will discuss in my part of the opening statement, principally the division between Madame Chia Liang and I is that she has been addressing what is commonly referred to as the crime base, and I will be concentrating on the roles and responsibilities of the accused. So I will be dealing with the roles and relations of the accused prior to 1975, the roles and the relations of the accused between 1975 and 1979, the organizational structure of the CPK and Democratic Kampuchea, and then the implementation of the five policies covered within the joint criminal enterprise that the closing order alleges, and that essentially covers paragraph one of your order of the 27th of June of 2011, in which you set out what you wish to be addressed in this opening statement. So let me begin. The case that you are about to hear and must determine rests very firmly on a self-evident principle of law and morality that individual human beings, men, women and children everywhere, are the touchstone of value and that societies and states must exist for their benefit and not for the benefit of those who govern. Also, that the people's rights to life, liberty, and the security of person come not from the largesse or generosity of the state, but are firmly rooted in law. More than anything, this case will demonstrate and remind the world of the utter human folly and human pity of uplifting and exalting the state, its needs, its plans, its goals, ultimately its self-consuming madness over and above the needs and rights of individual human beings. The three accused before you in this case are elderly people. Their advanced years may tempt in you feelings of sympathy or compassion. But let us not for one moment forget the catastrophic legacy that these three elders represent. In the space of less than four years, 
they took from the Cambodian people, all those dignities and freedoms that we hold as natural and inalienable rights in every human being. They murdered, tortured and terrorized their own people. They unleashed a radical social reform process, diverting and exploiting the human and material capital of this nation to create a living nightmare for all Khmeres. They took from the people everything that makes life worth living, family, faith, education, a place to rear one's children, a place to rest one's head. They enslaved and starved their own people. They sought out perceived enemies of their fledgling state everywhere. Intellectuals, capitalists, the middle classes, members of the former regime, so-called traitors, the Cham and the Vietnamese were all targeted for annihilation. They even banned love between human beings, that one noble quality that comes to the human heart more naturally than any other. Let us never for one moment forget in this trial that these are the malignant forces and this is the tragic legacy that these three elderly people represent. Before addressing the subject matter of this case, I want to set out for you and for the public the broad legal basis for this court. The court is, of course, a creature of domestic Cambodian legislation and an agreement with the United Nations. The court applies the code of criminal procedure of this country, at the same time applying a number of provisions of international humanitarian law and what has been come, come to be called in the modern era international criminal law. What is the origin of these international provisions? In the year 1941, at the height of the Second World War, a meeting took place on a warship off the coast of Newfoundland in Canada. At that meeting was the President of the United States of America, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and the British Prime Minister, Sir Winston Churchill. Amongst other matters, these two giants drafted a one-page document that came to be known as the Atlantic Charter, recognizing at this time that states were largely unconstrained by law and could wage war and murder and torture their own population with impunity, these two men committed to paper visionary ideas of common principles for a new world order. The Charter, consisting of three pillars, placed at its heart the commitment to human rights and the maintenance of the inherent dignity and to the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family. Between 1941 et and 1949, the Atlantic Charter would re be recast into the United Nations Charter of 1945. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948. The Genocide Convention of 1948. The Geneva Conventions of 1949, the Nuremberg Charter of 1945, and the International Military Tribunal, also of 1945, which would try the major Nazi war criminals. All of these instruments and acts affirmed the fundamental rights of human beings, the prevention and punishment of the crime of genocide limitations on the means and methods of warfare and ultimately that individual criminal responsibility would lie for war crimes and crimes against humanity. So, let us not for one moment fall prey to the assertion that there is a fragile legal basis for this trial. 
we are embarking on an unprecedented legal journey. In most respects, unprecedented in scale, but more importantly, unprecedented by the fact that the victims, the people of this kingdom and country, have patiently waited for more than an entire generation for the wheels of justice to turn. This will be, without question, one of the largest and most important series of criminal trials the world has seen in the modern age. There are, perhaps, only three sets of trials in the annals of international jurisprudence that can compare in magnitude to the cases that now lie before you. The trial of the leaders of the Nazi regime between 1945 and 1946. The trials of those responsible for the genocide of 900,000 of the Tutsi people in Rwanda in 1994, which are still ongoing, and the trial of Slobodan Milosevic, the former president of Yugoslavia between 2002 and 2006. The series of trials in which you must adjudicate involve between 1.7 and 2 million victims. The charges against these accused are supported by a case file that comprises of hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, witness statements and other evidence. One in four Cambodians perished under the democratic Kampuchea, as my colleague has already stated. A loss of life unknown to any nation since the slaughter of all adult men and the enslavement of the women and children of the island of Milos by the Athenian state 2,400 years ago. When judged in relative terms, by the proportion of the national population who died or were murdered, the scope of the human catastrophe unleashed by these accused on this country has no parallel in the modern era. Let us also be absolutely clear from the outset of this trial that the criminality that took place in those three years, eight months and 20 days was not accidental nor did it just happen. The plans that led to the death of two million people and the ruination of this country were prepared and deliberated long in advance of 1975. The forced movement, the enslavement, the murder and violence unleashed on minorities and so-called enemies of the CPK and the practice of forced marriage were all the result of cold calculation by these three elders before you, of perfectly conscious methods of pre-existing doctrine. The essence of the case against the accused is simple and clear. As senior leaders of the Communist Party of Kampuchea, Munchir, Yangseri and Kyusampan conceived and implemented criminal policies that enslaved an entire nation, caused the death of two million people and subjected the remainder of the Cambodian people to conditions of the most degrading inhumanity. The accused developed their criminal plans together in relations that go back to the 1950s and 1960s. During the period of democratic Kampuchea, from 17 April 1975 to 7 January 1979, at the height of their power, the accused lived and worked together, implementing their criminal policies through a hierarchical structure in which they received daily reports from all key organizations and provided direct instructions in response. Here, you, the photograph that you've just seen is of the three of them entering the Borikela rally. Two themes will resonate across this trial. First, the exacting, minute and obsessive control of the accused over all aspects of life in democratic Kampuchea. And second, their knowledge of the ongoing crimes being committed on their instructions and in their names. 
The co-prosecutors have described the organized brutality of the democratic Cambodia regime as a joint criminal enterprise comprising of five core policies. These are, first, the forced movement of the Cambodian population from cities and towns to rural areas. Second, the enslavement of the Cambodian people in work sites and agricultural cooperatives. Third, the use of violence to eliminate or smash enemies of the CPK through a nationwide network of re-education or security offices. Fourth, the targeting or persecution of specific groups, including Buddhists and the Cham and Vietnamese minorities. And fifth, the practice of forced marriage as a means to achieve population growth. It is quite certain, in my view, that one or all three of the accused will claim that there was no joint criminal enterprise to commit these crimes. Or if there were, they were not a part of it. The evidence will show otherwise of this fact, I assure you. But let us for one moment look at the beautifully crafted words of Robert Jackson at Nuremberg in July 1946, because those words resonate down the years and are instructive in this instance. I quote, the last stand of each defendant is that even if there was a conspiracy, he was not in it. It is therefore important in examining their attempts at avoidance of responsibility to know, first of all, just what it is that a conspiracy charge comprehends and punishes. In conspiracy, we do not punish one man for another man's crime. We seek to punish each for his own crime of joining a common criminal plan in which others also participate. The measure of the criminality of the plan and therefore of the guilt of each participant is of course the sum total of crimes committed by all in executing the plan. But the gist of the offence is participation in the formulation or execution of the plan. These are the rules which every society has found necessary in order to reach men like these defendants who never get blood on their own hands but who lay plans that result in the shedding of blood. End of quote. None of the accused here ever soiled his own hands with blood, but each of them, either alone or together, and with others now long dead, set in motion strictly enforced plans and policies which unleashed an ocean of blood in this country. I would also hasten to venture in this case, that the defense will direct blame for what took place at the feet of the dead. In particular, the prosecution anticipates that the defense will assert that much of the terror that took place in these, in these years will be laid at the grave of Salof Saar or Pol Pot. Robert Jackson can also assist us here. I quote, no matter how hard we have pressed the defendants on the stand, they have never pointed the finger at a living man as guilty. It is a temptation to ponder the wondrous workings of a fate which has only left the guilty dead and only the innocent alive. It is almost too remarkable. The chief villain on whom blame is placed, some of the defendants vie with each other in producing appropriate epithets, is Hitler. 
He is the man at whom nearly every defendant has pointed an accusing finger. I shall not dissent from this consensus, nor do I deny that all these dead and missing men share the guilt. In crimes so reprehensible that degrees of guilt have lost their significance, they may have played the most evil parts. But their guilt cannot ex exculpate the defendants. Hitler did not carry all responsibility to the grave with him. All the guilt is not wrapped in Himmler's shroud. It was these dead men whom these living chose to be their partners in this great conspiratorial brotherhood. And the crimes that they did together, they must pay for one by one. And so, the prosecution agree in this case that yes, Pol Pot and others now long past are also responsible for the two million dead. But to suggest that this exonerates or can acquit the three living accused before you is an utter absurdity. These three men here were actors with Pol Pot. They planned and schemed for years with Pol Pot as to what would take place when they seized power in this country. The evidence will show their degrees of personal involvement in hideous plans and the implementation of those plans that led to these terrible crimes. You will not hear a contemporaneous word of public dissent from any one of them as to the terror that was unfolding before them between 1975 and 1979. Remember this when any one of them seeks to claim that the centers of power were right, either closed or half open to them, or that they knew nothing of the destruction of a quarter of their own people. Let me stress now, Your Honours, that this trial must be fair. The burden of proof is on the prosecution. We must prove the events that the closing order asserts took place. All three accused are presumed innocent until proven guilty. The accused are entitled to be well, well defended, which we know they are. They can challenge the evidence brought against them, and none can be compelled to give evidence either against themselves or each other. Many in this country may ponder why, in the face of this human tragedy, they caused that the three accused should be given any rights at all. But just imagine if we were to try and convict these three men under the same conditions they imposed on their own people, that we tortured and murdered witnesses to bring complaints against these three elderly men. It is a very great tribute indeed to the Cambodian people that they have chosen to submit these three men to the rigors of law and give them all of the rights which they gave to no one during their years of strength. Having stressed the importance of fairness, let us now go to 1979 to see what the Cambodian people found on their return to their homes after the Khmer Rouge were driven from power. The capital city and other metropolitan centers deserted and devoid of life. The S-21 security camp in Phnom Penh, evidencing the handiwork of the Khmer Rouge's secret police, hideously mutilated corpses of those tortured and murdered by the regime, the destruction of sites dedicated to religion and worship, the human remains of loved ones and neighbors, buried and scattered throughout the country. These are just some of the bitter and terrible fruits that Nguyen Chia, Yang Suri, and Q Sam Pan bequeathed to their own people. I'll now briefly begin addressing the roles and relationships of the three accused prior to 1975. 
the close working relationship between these accused goes back to the 1950s, when Yang Sari, Hu Sampan, and Pol Pot, then known as Salof Sar, were students in Paris and formed a Marxist-Leninist Students Association to promote communist revolution as a means of achieving independence for Cambodia. Pol Pot and Yang Sari would soon become brothers-in-law, marrying sisters Q Ponnery and Q Tirith, now Ying Tirith. After their return from France, they would join forces with Nguyen Chia, who would first join the Communist Party while living in Thailand in the 1940s, where he studied law and worked at the Thai Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Nguyen Chia remained active in the communist movement following his return to Cambodia, and in 1955 he was appointed secretary of the Phnom Penh Committee of the Khmer People's Revolutionary Party. One of the other members of that committee under Nguyen Chia was Pol Pot, and they were later joined by Yang Seri. Together, they began to make plans to establish a new communist party in Cambodia. On 30th of September 1960, Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, and Yang Seri were part of a small group meeting in the living quarters of a railway worker in Phnom Penh to establish the Workers' Party of Kampuchea, the precursor of the CPK. At that first party conference, Nguyen Chia was elected Deputy Secretary, number two, a position he would continue to hold over the next three decades. Below Nguyen Chia were Pol Pot, an elected member of the party standing committee, and Yang Seri appointed as a member of the Central Committee and alternate member of the Standing Committee. Your Honours, I describe this event 15 years before the forced evacuation of Phnom Penh because of the fateful decision taken by the accused at that very meeting to adopt a core party line authorizing the use of armed violence to eliminate so-called feudalists, capitalists, and other enemies of the CPK. The plan remained in effect after the accused seized power in April 1975. This murderous policy, designed by these accused, in a nondescript room, in this very city, more than 50 years ago, would result in the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of their fellow Cambodians, enemies of the party, one and all. Your Honours, from September 1960 until April 1975, the accused continued to work together towards their common goal of revolution in Cambodia. By the Second Party Congress in February 1963, the Party Secretary Tu Samut had been arrested. Nguyen Chia himself proposed that Pol Pot should become the new Party Secretary or Brother Number One. Nguyen Chia remained Deputy Secretary and Yang Seri became a full rights member of the Standing Committee, the third highest ranking member of the party. A few months later, Yang Seri, Pol Pot, Son Sen and other party leaders found their names published on a list of known leftists. They fled to the jungle, first to a Vietnamese military base on the border and later a remote corner of Ratanakiri province. Their new party base was called Office 100. From these beginnings, a spider web of party structures would spread across Cambodia. Nguyen Chia, whose identity as a party leader remained secret during these years, stayed in Phnom Penh and was responsible for the party's operations throughout the country. The accused would meet throughout these years to take key decisions through the party's central and standing committees. In mid-1967, CPK leaders decided to launch an open armed struggle the following year, and in January 19 in 1968, it was Nguyen Chia who conveyed the orders for the initial guerrilla attacks by CPK forces against a government army post south of the city of Batambong.
de Maquisard, that day would later be celebrated by the CPK as the birth of the revolutionary army of Kampuchea, the RAK. Accused Hugh Sampan is believed to have joined the party during the 1950s while in France, but he concealed his true allegiances upon his return to Cambodia in 1959, assuming an active role in the public affairs of this country. In 1962, he joined the ruling Sankum Rheonil party, was elected to the National Assembly and appointed Secretary of State for Commerce. As a suspected leftist, however, Q. Sampan was eventually forced to resign from his position and under constant threat of arrest. Having been targeted for his own political beliefs, Q. Sampan was well aware of the consequences of the CPK's plan to pursue the arrest, detention and execution of political enemies. In April 1967, facing blame for student riots and a summons to appear before a military tribunal, Hugh Sampan and two others fled Phnom Penh for the jungle under the protection of the CPK Central Committee member Tamok. Vanished from view and widely presumed to be dead, Hugh Sampan, Hu Nim and Hu Yun would reappear three years later as the three ghosts of the Khmer Rouge. On 18 March 1970, a day etched in the memory of a generation. His Royal Highness, Prince Norodom Sihanouk, the King Father, as he then was, was overthrown in a coup d'etat by General Lon Nol and Prince Sirik Mata. The Khmer Republic had arrived. History had opened a path to power for the CPK which the accused did not hesitate to seize. The party formed an alliance with Prince Norodom Sihanouk that consisted of a resistance movement, the National United Front of Kampuchea, or FUNC, and a government in exile based in Beijing, the Royal Government of National Union of Kampuchea, or GRUNK, as it came to be known. From 1970 to 1975, in the throes of resistance and, re and revolution, the accused took on additional roles, extending both their circles of influence and structures of control. Nguyen Chia finally left Phnom Penh and joined his comrades at the party headquarters in Ratanakiri. The headquarters was moved again to the border between the provinces of Kampong Cham and Kampong Tom. By May 1970, Q Sampan took on senior positions in the civilian and military structures of the resistance. As Deputy Prime Minister of Grung and Commander-in-Chief of the National Liberation Armed Forces. He had evidently served the party well and at the Third Party Congress in 1970 was rewarded with a promotion to candidate member of the Central Committee. By December 1970, Yang Suri was in Hanoi and has, had established a radio station speaking for the resistance. By April 1971, he had moved to Beijing, the seat of the government in exile, to raise foreign support for the CPK and monitored and controlled the activities of the resistance movement on behalf of the party. He would return to Cambodia to join meetings of the party central and standing committees. At one of these meetings in June 1974, party leaders first agreed on the strategy to evacuate Phnom Penh after its supposed liberation. Mr. President, I can take a pause at that point because I'm moving to a new part of my opening, so if you wish to conclude at this point, I can finish for the day here. Hello. The international co-prosecutor, do you have another 15 minutes uh, le co vous avez to 15 continue minutes. with your opening statement? If I could now turn to the period from April 
1975 to January 1979 to explore the roles of the three accused. So now I turn to 17 April 1975. On this day, the CPK seized power in Cambodia and the accused began their implementation of the party's criminal policies. Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia and Q San Pan travelled to Phnom Penh together, arriving on the 20th of April 1975. Yang Suri would arrive from China a few days later on 24 April 1975. For the next month, the accused and other CPK leaders worked together initially at the Phnom Penh railway station and later at the Silver Pagoda, finalizing policies and plans for implementation. The vast network of party structures stood at the ready. The plans drawn up by the accused at the party center were channeled to zone, sector, district, and military representatives during a six-day mass meeting provided a, presided over by Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia, who himself dictated the party line to the audience. The first day of that meeting, the 20th of May 1975, is now a national day of mourning in Cambodia, known as the Day of Hatred, in recognition of the criminal policies put into effect by the accused at that time. Your Honours, those very policies, raw and tragic for every victim of the DK regime, have been put before you and will be discussed in some detail tomorrow. Within months, the accused moved into permanent offices and living quarters from which they broadened and deepened their exacting control of the country. A site known as K1, which you can see on the screens in front of you, was the primary office and residence of brother number one, Pol Pot, and was located on the Tonle Basso riverfront, just south of the current location of the National Assembly. Just au sud de, de it was de a large two-story building surrounded by a wall of planks étages, and wire grand, with four towers around the perimeter manned on each side by a team of 50 de, de to 60 guards. Next you will see a pier on the map, K3. K3 consisted of an entire block of houses west of the royal palace at Rue Pasteur that was barricaded with corrugated iron sheeting and barbed wire and also patrolled by guards. A number of the guards, messengers and drivers, worked for the accused at K1 and K3. They will describe for your honours how Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri and Q Sampan lived together at K3, working most days at K1 and returning to K3 at night. Each of the accused also had Chacun other offices and positions during the DK period, in, in addition to their high-ranking positions within the party. All three accused were appointed to top positions in the Democratic Kampuchea government that was formed in April 1976 to replace Grun, as illustrated here. Nguyen Chia, as president of the People's Representative Assembly, the state legislative body, Yang Seri as Deputy Le, Prime Minister responsible for foreign affairs, Yang Seri, and Q Sampan as President of the State Presidium, the Head of State. Du Your Honours, while their de... appointments to these state positions no doubt reflected their senior status as leaders of the CPK and conferred some power, privileges and responsibilities. The facts will establish that the true power held by each of the accused was derived from their positions within the party. Nguyen Chia, as Deputy Secretary of the CPK Standing Committee, charged with responsibility for party affairs and political education and training of its cadres, Yang Seri is one of only five un full rights members of the Standing de Committee permanent. and the person entrusted to represent the regime in its international affairs. De dans les affaires internationales. Q Sampan as a member of the Central Committee, a de facto member of the Standing de Committee, du comité the political chairman of Office 870 and 870. responsible for overseeing commerce matters throughout the country. 
As young Seri himself said, Comme Yang Seri l'a lui-même dit, dans une entrevue donnée en mai 1977, Democratic Kampuchea, le Democratic Cambodia is le Cambodge by démocratique Ankar. est gouverné par l'Ankar. L'Ankar est le seul parti et l'État. L'État est le parti et le parti est l'État. And party l'État are one. et le parti ne font qu'un. Il n'existe que l'Ankar. Mesdames et Messieurs les juges, voilà le fondement même de ce système totalitaire de contrôle social conçu et mis en œuvre par les accusés. Laissez-moi vous illustrer et en faisant ça, vous adresser directement les distinctifs rôles des accusés dans le passé. Et ce faisant, je me pencherai directement sur les rôles précis de chacun des accusés à l'intérieur de la partie. Dans ses déclarations faites au cours des instructions et les ouvrages qu'il a écrits récemment, Kusampan a répété régulièrement qu'il n'avait pas de véritable pouvoir comme président du Président de l'État. Cette affirmation, toutefois, se fie du fait qu'il avait pouvoir et autorité comme président du CPK. Where he was both a member du PCK, of the party central committee and a regular attendee at meetings of the standing committee. The central and standing committee were the highest ranking and most powerful bodies of the CPK and Democratic Kampuchea. All Democratic Kampuchea organizations, including the zones, Centre militaire de division et gouvernement ministère du centre, et les ministères du gouvernement. Under the party's own governing statute, the Central Committee was the highest operational unit throughout the country, responsible to implement the party political line and statute, instruct all zone, sector and party organizations to carry out activities according to the political line and to govern and arrange cadres and party members. Q. Sampan has admitted that he was one of the 30 full rights members of the Central Committee which met every six months. Because the Central Committee was comprised of members located throughout the country and not every six months and met only every six months, the day-to-day -day exercise of its powers was wielded by a standing committee, which you see here, comprised of four, five full rights members, Secretary Pol Pot, Deputy Secretary Nguyen Chia, Yang Seri, Sao Pim, and Tam Mok, and two alternate members, Son Sen and Von Vet. Q. Sampan has stated that the standing committee met at least once a week, and often more frequently. Because of the CPK's obsession with secrecy and the widespread destruction of documents, we do not have all the minutes of this body's meetings. But fortunately, we have enough of a sample to understand how the standing committee worked, what subjects it discussed, and who attended its meetings. The chart that you see in front of you on the screen reflects the attendance of various individuals at the 17 standing committee meetings for which we do have minutes, identifying the persons present. As you can see, Q. Sampan is listed as present for 14 of the 17 meetings, a fact that he's admitted to the co-investigating judges. Indeed, Q. Sampan was present at more of those standing committee meetings than Yang Seri who was sometimes absent travelling abroad. Full right members Tarmok and Sao Pim and alternate members Son Sen and Von Vet. Only Pol Pot and Nguyen Chia attended standing committee meetings more frequently than Q. Sampant. The minutes also reflect that Q. Sampant presented and discussed a variety of issues at standing committee meetings, contrary to his assertion to the co-investigating judges that he never had a speaking role at any such meetings. Another reason it is important to understand the relationship between state and party in democratic Kampuchea is the claim made by Nguyen Chia to the co-investigating judges that he was busy with the legislative work of the People's Representative Assembly, of which he was president and hence not involved with the executive. In reality, Nguyen Chia's Assembly never met, never held a vote, never adopted a single law and was not even elected, contrary to the propaganda broadcast on the DK state radio. The truth 
about the People's Representative Assembly is reflected in the minutes of an 8 March 1976 Standing Committee meeting attended by Nguyen Chia and Q Sam Pan, at which the CPK senior leaders discussed how they should not speak playfully about the Assembly in front of the people to let them see that we are deceptive and our assembly is worthless. And here you see the minutes of that particular standing committee. What work then did Nguyen Chia actually do when he was at his assembly office? The chamber will hear testimony on this question from S21 chairman Kang Goik Eve, alias Doik, who met with Nguyen Chia every three to five days between September 1977 and January 1979, usually at his assembly office. At these meetings, Nguyen Chia gave Doik instructions regarding who was to be arrested and who was to be smashed. Thus, even at his assembly office, the only work Nguyen Chia did, as far as we can tell, was to plan who was going to be murdered next and in some cases to call those persons to meetings where they were promptly arrested and taken to S21. The People's Assembly was a faux institution designed to give the external appearance of democratic activity in what was in fact a totalitarian state controlled by the Standing and Central Committees of the CPK. And Nguyen Chia's Assembly Office was simply another part of the killing apparatus. Yang Seri's responsibilities included dealing with diplomatic personnel and other Cambodians located abroad. During the early part of the regime, he oversaw the closing of most Cambodian embassies and ordered the return of those diplomats to democratic Cambodia. He also spoke to groups of Cambodian nationals located in France and other countries, portraying a rosy picture of life under the CPK and encouraging them to return home. Your Honours will hear testimony from some of the students and intellectuals who returned to Cambodia after April 1975, based on the representations of Yang Seri. When they landed at Pochitong Airport, they were met by Ministry of Foreign Affairs cadre. Their passports were taken and all of their possessions seized. They were imprisoned in re-education camps under the control of Yang Seri, Chang Chamres and Bong Trabe, where they were subjected to political indoctrination and forced labor. Those who were determined to be at odds with the party were taken to S21 and killed. Yang Seri has admitted his critical role in the return of Cambodian expatriates, stating, I quote, I am very regretful for the deaths of the intellectuals, because I was the one who gathered them to come to help build the country. Mr. President, that is an appropriate point for me to pause if you wish to finish for the day now. The President, thank you, International Co-Prosecutor. It is now appropriate for today's adjournment. We will now adjourn and resume tomorrow morning starting from 9 a.m. The security guards are starting to bring the three accused back to the detention facility and bring them back to the courtroom tomorrow morning before 9 a.m.